So uh, uh, welcome this evening. It's uh, nice to see everyone out on this uh, gorgeous uh, spring night. Uh, this is uh, the Constitutional Law Center's third uh, annual Publius Symposium. Uh, we started this to provide an occasion for a serious discussion of a recent book relating to uh, constitutional law. So we pick our favorite each year. Uh, and uh, in the past, some of you may have been here for uh, um, Mary Sarah Builder's wonderful book, Madison's Hand, and then uh, for uh, uh, Philip Hamburger's uh, a book is Un Administrative Law Unlawful. And tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, a panel for the discussion of Jonathan Gienapp's uh, very recent book, uh, The Second Creation, uh, the, fi the Fixing the American Constitution in the, uh, uh, in the Early Republic, uh, and a distinguished panel of commentators. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Amalia Kessler, who is going to be our moderator for this evening. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you and um, our wonderful uh, author and, and, and panelists um, on behalf of the Stanford Center for Law and History, which I direct uh, and co-sponsor. We are co-sponsoring this wonderful event with the Con Law Center. Um, uh, and I can think of no more perfect uh, book to uh, really represent this uh, marriage of uh, law and history than uh, Jonathan Ginnap's uh, wonderful uh, second creation, which really highlights um, the ways in which uh, bringing to bear uh, a set of historical methodologies that we tend to see sometimes more in the history department can shed light on uh, a set of debates that um, are, are very familiar in law school. So let me just say a few words. It's my honor to introduce this, this panel. Um, Jonathan Ginnap is an assistant uh, professor of history here at Stanford. Uh, he received his uh, undergrad uh, degree from Harvard and a uh, PhD in history from Johns Hopkins. Uh, his work really focuses on the revolutionary period and the early republic uh, with a particular attention to questions of political culture, constitutionalism, and intellectual history. Uh, and we are, of course, here to celebrate uh, the, the recent publication of his book, uh, The Second Creation, Fixing the American Constitution in the Founding Era, which was uh, just recently published by Harvard Press, and chronicles how and why a founding era Americans' understanding of their constitution transformed in the earliest years of uh, the document's existence. Uh, to date, the book has uh, received all kinds of nice uh, recognition, including the Thomas J. Wilson Memorial Prize from Harvard Press, and it was a finalist for the uh, Frederick Jackson Turner Award from the Organization of American Historians. Uh, he's written on uh, a bunch of other topics pertaining to early American constitutionalism and interpretation, uh, including especially uh, uh, debates uh, at the present over constitutional originalism, which I suspect we'll have more to hear about uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, uh, our panelists in the, in the order here that they'll be speaking are um, Sai Prakash, who is the James Monroe Distinguished Professor of Law and the Paul G. Mahoney Research Professor of Law at the University of Virginia Law School. Um, his fo scholarship focuses on uh, separation of powers um, and especially executive powers. Um, he's published uh, a wealth of articles on founding era history and its relation to many aspects of the Constitution, um, especially the power of the presidency and the role of Congress. Uh, and his book, Imperial from the Beginning, the Constitution of the Original uh, Executive, is regarded as one of the, the major works on the meaning of Article Two of the Constitution. Uh, Jack Rakoff is the William Robertson Co-Professor of History and American Studies here at Stanford, as well as a professor of law by courtesy here at the law school. He's one of the nation's leading experts on James Madison and American constitutional history more generally. He is the author of uh, many books, uh, including Original Meanings, Politics and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution, which won the Pulitzer Prize in History, uh, and he is a member of uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and a past president of the Society for the History of the Early American Republic. Last but not least, uh, right here on my left, we have um, Bernie Myler, who is the Carl and Sheila Spaeth Professor of Law uh, here at Stanford Law School. 
She's also currently a co-associated uh, dean for curriculum. Uh, her scholarship focuses on British and American constitutional law, uh, and especially the long history of constitutionalism reaching back into the English common law ancestry of the US Constitution. Uh, one of her current book projects is Common Law Originalism, which looks at multiple 18th century common law meetings, both colonial and English, um, of various constitutional terms and phrases, uh, in part to argue that we ought to reject the pursuit of a singular uh, and determinate original meaning. In addition to her work in constitutional history, she is an expert uh, in law and the humanities, uh, uh, including law and literature, uh, as it relates to law and theater. Uh, so with that, uh, I gather my duty is to keep us on track so that uh, we have time for conversation with all of you. So I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Amalia, for, um, for chairing this symposium and for those generous introductions. Thanks especially to Michael McConnell. This is a great honor that he selected my book uh, to be this, the occasion of this symposium. And Mark Storsley, without whom uh, nothing logistical would get done at the Constitutional Law Center. And he's done a great deal to bring this all together. And I, of course, want to thank my symposium uh, participants as well, especially Sai, uh, who has made it across country um, for this event, which I really, really appreciate. So I'm going to try to keep my remarks uh, rather brief, just offering a general overview of the book, some of the key subjects I, I, I explore, some of the main arguments I try to make. And I think the best way to do this is to think about what my book is trying to do at bottom, which I like to think what it's trying to do is rethink the conventional story of American constitutional creation. So obviously, the subject of American constitutional creation has received an enormous amount of attention for some time now. But virtually all of the attempts to understand and explain the creation of the United States Constitution tend to focus on the events and debates of 1787 and 1788, when the Constitution was written and ratified. So if you look at most studies of the creation of the Constitution, they of course focus on the Constitutional Convention that took place in the summer of 1787 between May and September when 55 delegates gathered in Philadelphia and actually wrote what became and still is the United States federal constitution. And then they often as well will focus in detail on the nine month period that followed from September to July 1787 to 1788, in which the Constitution was put up for ratification to the people of the United States. And they determined whether or not they would assent uh, to this document that had been proposed by the conventions. In most tellings, I think it's fair to say that the story of American constitutional creation usually is seen as ending with ratification. And something of a categorical line separates what comes before up through ratification and what comes after. So the period up through ratification is a story of making, inventing, authoring. And the story of what comes after is the much different story of implementing, construing, and fleshing out. Uh, whatever else might have been true in 1788, it seems the Constitution, as a matter of fact, existed. And up to that point, Americans had been invested in the activity of creating a constitution. And thereafter, they were invested, and we still are invested, in the much different activity of merely interpreting one. So my book, The Second Creation, what it tries to do really at bottom is suggest that we ought to rethink this conventional account of American constitutional creation by recognizing especially that the decade that followed ratification did as much to create the constitution as anything that came before. So to truly understand how the Constitution was created, we have to look as well to this decade that followed ratification, to what I call the second creation. And the key to doing this, to reimagining the conventional story of American constitutional creation, I argue, is to begin by appreciating an important and often little recognized fact, which was when the Constitution first appeared, it was shrouded in uncertainty. Not only was the Constitution's meaning unclear, but far more significantly, it was unclear what the Constitution itself actually was. So in 1789, when political leaders began putting the freshly ratified Constitution into effect, they could not simply ask, what does this part of the Constitution mean? Or what does that part of the Constitution mean? The sort of more familiar set of questions that we often ask today. The Constitution's first users had to wrestle with a much more fundamental question. They had to ask, what even is 
the Constitution. Because no matter the depth of American constitutional debate to that point, there were still, at the time the Constitution was ratified, no straightforward answers to a set of fundamental questions that really cut to the core of the Constitution. For one, what kind of an object was the federal Constitution? Was it a written text, a piece of linguistic communication that was defined by its linguistic content? Or was it something different, um, maybe a system of constituent powers or a framework for future politics or maybe something else entirely? Two, what defined its character? Was it alike in, in kind to other kinds of legal instruments then in existence, such as statutes or contracts or charters of incorporation or fiduciary trusts or treaties, or maybe even just other constitutions like those that had been written at the state level following the Declaration of Independence? Or was it completely novel in kind with no parallels out there? Third, was the Constitution born complete and finished? Or was it incomplete and unfinished? And if so, how exactly and who would be responsible for filling in its gaps and resolving its uncertainties? Four, how or by whom was the Constitution to be enforced? And then fifth, just a final point that was uncertain, did the Constitution come with any built-in rules for using it? A user's manual, if you will. If it didn't, then where were those rules to be found? Or how were those to be constructed? So in short, what I want to suggest, what I try to suggest in the book, is that the Constitution was born in flux. At the time it was born, virtually everybody agreed that it was the fundamental law of the United States. It was the ultimate arbiter of political and legal life. But they couldn't really agree on much beyond that. So what this meant is that the people who first put the Constitution into effect in order to interpret the Constitution, in order to interpret specific parts of it, first had to answer or resolve these open questions, these much larger questions about what the Constitution's fundamental identity really was. And in doing so, they had to imagine what kind of thing the Constitution was, and they had to debate that. And what I argue in the book is that the 1790s were really a great struggle over this, over how to justifiably imagine the new Constitution, its properties, its character, and its content. And this content played out across a whole range of settings throughout the nation, but I focus in particular on the debates that took place in the halls of the first Congresses. One, I do so because I think it's really important to understand some of the subtle changes in constitutional transformation that's often ignored to recreate these debates in some detail, but two, because in many ways, I would argue, Congress was really the center of constitutional gravity when the Constitution was born. Today, we tend to think of the Supreme Court being um, the central arbiter of the Constitution, resolving um, litigation over its meaning. But before it assumed that customary role, Congress was really the center of gravity. And in particular, I look at um, four debates in Congress after surveying the 1770s and 1780s, looking at the Constitutional Convention and ratification. I really focus on four debates in particular between 1789 and 1796 that focused on the Constitution. The first was in the spring of 1789, really the first debate uh, that Congress involved itself in over the Constitution, which was a debate over who could remove executive officers. The Constitution was silent on this subject. If there were cabinet officers, like a Secretary of Treasury, who had the right, if anybody, to remove them? Um, two, I look at uh, another very important debate in the summer of 1789 over amending the Constitution, what we now refer to as debates over the creation of the Bill of Rights. But in particular, I look more not at what was added, what became the First Amendment or the Second Amendment or the Fourth Amendment, but the first debate they had over how to amend the Constitution. Would they add an appendix at the end, or would they interweave? Would they literally amend the Constitution? What were they allowed to do? What should they do? Third, I look at the debate over chartering a national bank, which was a signature piece of Alexander Hamilton's uh, program, now hip hop star, so we all know what this <laughs> refers to. Um, it was an extraordinarily contentious proposal uh, that James Madison inaugurated a constitutional debate by claiming that Congress did not bank. Um, and then fourth and last, I look at the debate over the Jay Treaty uh, negotiated by John Jay, which tried to resolve a lot of long-standing disputes traced back to the revolution between Britain and the United States. And those who thought it was far too favorable to the British 
thought that the matter was not resolved when the President and Senate, as the Constitution seemed to say, put the treaty into effect. Uh, those who were opposed to um, the Washington administration and the House of Representatives claimed that they had a say in treaty making, despite what the Constitution seemed to say. So these debates were dominated by a lot of figures that are more familiar household names, like James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, but lots of other individuals uh, that were extremely important but are not as well known, like Elbridge Gerry, for whom uh, we have gerrymandering or gerrymandering uh, to thank for, Fisher Ames, John Lawrence, Elias Boudinot, James Wilson, a whole range of individuals who were involved in these far-reaching conversations. And I focus on these debates in particular because all of them started on something fairly narrow and quickly transcended those narrow horizons to focus not on the immediate issue that had prompted the debate, but these much bigger unresolved questions that had come out of ratification about what the Constitution itself was, what was its fundamental character, what were people living under the Constitution allowed to do with it or not allowed to do with it. I, I argue they really became debates over that. And in narrating these debates, I try to bring to the fore the different ways in which Early American political leaders having these debates over the Constitution breathed life into and over time normalized particular ways of conceiving of the Constitution. So I trace different kinds of arguments and the images of the Constitution that were implied by them and see how they collided with one another and how some died out and how others gained in strength until they sort of gradually and imperceptibly uh, became second nature premises through which people began talking about the Constitution. And it was through this process of breathing life into ways of conceiving the Constitution, normalizing those ways of thinking about it and talking about it and seeing it that I think helps explain how those who involved themselves in these debates helped create the Constitution. They didn't literally rewrite it, but they gave the Constitution a lot of its core characteristics by establishing certain norms and practices that made it easier to see it one way and harder to see it other ways. And in helping to create the Constitution, uh, they also helped affect a significant transformation in American constitutional imagination, a transformation that I tried to chart throughout um, the book, and I'll just end briefly by mentioning what this is. Um, so this was a transformation in imagining what kind of thing the Constitution was that turned on the ambiguities embedded in the concept of fixing or fixation. So fixing now and at the time had at least two distinct kinds of meanings, either to fix as in to repair or correct or resolve something, or fixing as in to set it in stone, to cement it to prevent it from changing or moving. And during the decade that followed ratification, as early American political leaders debated the Constitution, they initially struggled, I argue, to fix or resolve what they took to be an uncertain or amorphous constitutional system. But in so doing, gradually and unwittingly ended up fixing or cementing a very particular notion of the Constitution as a distinctively textual and historical artifact that was circumscribed in space and time. Over the course of the 1790s, as politicians did, who disagreed on pretty much everything, gradually came to um, agree that appealing to the history of the Constitution's creation could help resolve its uncertainty, and in so doing made it easier to see the Constitution as a discrete object fixed in time. And what I think this really shows is that consequently, a lot of things we take to be essential to the Constitution, hardwired into it at birth, absolutely um, essential to how we might talk about it, were really a byproduct not of the primordial essence of the Constitution, but of debates in the 1790s that normalized and naturalized certain ways of thinking about it, certain ways of thinking about whether it was fixed or not, uh, many of which endure still to this day. I'll leave it at that. Well, I'm delighted to be back at my alma mater. It's uh, always a pleasure to return to Stanford. Um, truth be told, I would have come here to discuss a mediocre or bad book. Um, <laughs> luckily, I don't find myself in that predic predicament at all. Uh, the Second Creation is a simply outstanding book. It's meticulous, fair to all, incredibly well written. It's engaging. It's a page turner. 
It's the Harry Potter of, of books. And it, it, belongs, it belongs right next to Jack's book, Original Meanings, on the, on the top shelf there. And I got to say, it's odd that you know, Jonathan doesn't have the book to show you guys. This is the book, and it's an incredible book. And you, know, you won't get the flags. Those are mine. But uh, it's an incredible book, and I, you know, I would encourage you all to go out and buy it. Operators are standing by. So um, Jonathan's project consists of ex excavating early constitutional discourse and discovering when the idea of a fixed constitution arose. He traces the idea to the, 19, sorry, the 1796 Jay Treaty debate. The Jay Treaty debate was about whether the House uh, had discretion uh, about whether to implement the Jay Treaty's provisions. There had been a controversy about whether to, the Senate should ratify the Jay Treaty or more, more precisely consent to the ratification by the President. And then there was a discussion about whether the President should actually ratify it. And the, the Jay Treaty just passed the two-thirds threshold. And so it was a huge debate in the country. And the House wanted to continue the debate in a sense. And, and it's from that point on, I think, that Jonathan identifies the idea of a fixed constitution. Um, mark me as an admiring dissenter from the thesis. I think the idea of a fixed constitution predates the Constitution and, and certainly predates the Jay debate. Um, why do I think this? Well, I think the idea of fixity is uh, part and parcel of a written Constitution, and I'm very much in John Marshall's camp. He, of course, said this after the Jay debate, uh, um, so he could have been influenced by it, but I think, I think it's a sensible supposition to suppose that when people painstakingly write down a, a document and spend months doing, that, doing so and then spend years discussing whether to actually make it law, which is what the ratification debates are. They, they are supposing some fixity to it. Um, the second thing I'd say is um, there's an amendment process which presupposes fixity, right? Article 5 has this very detailed amendment process that doesn't specify every rule, you know, rule necessary to decide how you amend the Constitution, but it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty detailed, and you don't need to have that if, if it's not relatively fixed. Right? And so there's a fixed process for changing the relatively fixed instrument. You, um, I think there are rules of interpretation that Jonathan cites. As I told you, he's very fair-minded. He cites Blackstone and how Blackstone discusses the interpretation of legal text. And one of the things you look to is the context in which it was written and the purpose for which it were, it were written. And I think those are rules that apply to the Constitution. Uh, and then I think, finally, people take an oath to the Constitution, an oath, I think, that presupposes something fixed. If the oath taker can decide to have the Constitution mean what he or she makes of it, then the oath is really sort of a meaningless gesture, right? I take a note to something, I decide what it means, and it can mean something that uh, will change over time. Um, so I believe the framers thought the, uh, the, you know, the Constitution was fixed, and I think we can see this by how they treated the Articles. The Articles were too fixed. The Articles of Confederation was this proto-Constitution uh, that was drafted in Congress and ratified many years later uh, when the final state ratified it in 1781. And it had a rule for amending the Articles, which was unanimity. And uh, the the, basically, the people at the time found this rule uh, too restrictive of a straitjacket. It was too hard to amend the, the Articles and fix its problems. And so they just chose to bypass the rules in the Articles with respect to amendment by just creating a new convention that would create a new constitution that would take effect without regard to the uh, Articles of Confederation's rules of unanimity. But you wouldn't need to do any of that if you could just reinterpret the Articles uh, to have them mean something different. I think it was precisely because it was fixed and because the amendment process was too fixed that they decided to, to bypass it. Um, and so in a way, they, you know, they responded to the ultra-fixity of the Articles by, you know, by doing something you might think is extra-legal. But they still thought that the extra legal document they were creating um, was fixed. Um, was fixed. Um, so let me talk about Jonathan's four examples. Um, removal. Uh, removal is this very important debate that takes place in 1789 in the House. Um, what's the relationship between presidents and department heads? And there's a number, there's a range of opinions, as Jonathan points out in his book and his remarks today. And uh, those are, you know, I think those are serious debates by serious people having honest differences of opinion. Um, but it's a circumscribed debate. No one is saying something like, well, I think the states can remove 
executive officers, or I think the Pope can remove executive officers. There's a range of plausible interpretations. There's good faith disagreements about uh, you know, which of those answers is the right one, which is more plausible, which is less plausible. But there's a, you know, it's not as if it's open season on the question of removal. Now, truth be told, I think the argument that uh, impeachment is the only means of removing an officer, I think that was a silly argument. And it, its silliness is reflected by the fact that only a handful of people actually advanced it. But the other three arguments, that the Constitution itself vested removal authority with the president, that the Constitution required the Senate's consent prior to removal because the Senate's consent was necessary to appoint, and the final argument that Congress could decide to grant removal authority based on its sense of either what the Constitution required or what would be a sound policy. I think those are, those are uh, sensible positions that one could derive from the Constitution. But my more general point is I, I don't view that as a, a a set, a, an argument that suggests the Constitution wasn't fixed. I think it's a, a disagreement about what the Constitution provided. And I, you know, I think it's uh, people who have the view, or originals who have the view that the Constitution's meaning is just easily discernible on, on all questions, I think, um, are doing a disservice to the theory. I think Jonathan's quite right, and he ex, you know, expertly shows that there are differences of opinion uh, on many matters. Um, but, you know, if someone at the founding, at 1798 said, you know, the Senate can can impeach and the House can try impeachments, the reverse of what the Constitution says, I don't think that would be a viable argument that anyone would make. And I think that's because it's fixed in the Constitution that the House has the sole power to impeach and the Senate has the sole power to try. And those, word, you know, those words um, are more clear than, say, removal is. The Bill of Rights discussion that Jonathan has, another just superb discussion, uh, very illuminating. He talks about how adding the amendments at the end of the Constitution sort of made the original Constitution sacred, in a way. It's a sacred text. And I, you know, I, thought of it, I thought of this, and I said, look, I can sacralize text even if you intersperse the amendments into the Constitution. That is to say, I can, I can think very highly of the text and, and treat it as an object of veneration, even if you, uh, you know, move the First Amendment to some part of Article I, Section 9, or Article I, Section 8. It's not, it's not the fact that they're at the end that makes people venerate the Constitution. It's, I don't think that matters one whit. Um, I think it's, it's, it's the fact that it's, it constitutes our government and people think that the people who drafted it had a certain wisdom. Uh, whether that's true or not is another question, but I don't know if it really matters uh, whether Madison won that fight or whether he, whether he lost it. Um, on, the, on the bank, I think this is again a, a situation where um, people are on, having honest disagreements about the, the import of the necessary and proper clause. And you can see why they'd have that. There, there's, a, there's a sense that the Constitution establishes a limited federal government with enumerated powers. And there's a sense that the proponents of the Bank of the United States are violating this first principle by creating an institution that's not mentioned in the Constitution. Um, my views on this have changed over time. I, I think I originally agreed with Madison, but I think Hamilton had the better argument in retrospect. There are all kinds of things in the Constitution that the Constitution, there are all kinds of things that the Constitution doesn't mention that early Congresses are doing. They're passing crimes that aren't mentioned in the Constitution. They're creating departments, even though there's no express or specific authority to create departments. Um, they're doing all kinds of things that aren't specifically provided there. And, and Jonathan's discussion is illuminating because he describes a, a, a debate that isn't focused on the constitutionality until much later in the debate. That is to say, at some point in time, Madison and others raise a constitutional argument. And it makes me wonder whether it's done for political reasons or whether they really believe that there's a problem with a bank any more than there's a problem with a Department of Treasury. You won't find an article in the Constitution that says that Congress can make a, a, a department of any sort. It's just, I think, it's implied in the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, and then the, the you know, I, I would add one other thing about uh, how the meaning of the Constitution can change over time, even though it's fixed. And I, this brings to mind uh, what Chief Justice Rehnquist said about the Constitution in wartime. And he said the Constitution in wartime uh, speaks in a different voice. And I think that may aptly describe how to think about the necessary and proper clause. That is to say, some things might be necessary and proper in certain situations and might not be necessary and proper in other, other situations. The meaning of the clause is fixed, but its application will change over time. Let me give you a more concrete example. Uh, can Congress suspend the privilege of the writ? Well, Article 1, Section 9 says the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus can only be suspended in invasion or rebellion. 
That power is always latent, but it can only be exercised in a particular factual context. Mm -hmm. So the meaning is fixed, but the uh, its application, meaning what Congress can actually do, I think changes with the circumstances. I don't think that means that the Constitution's meaning isn't fixed. I think it just means that it will apply differently in different <coughs> circumstances. And then finally on the Jay Treaty, um, I regard uh, the disagreement there again as an honest disagreement, you know, coupled with the usual sort of partisan politics. The Federalists wanted to say that the, uh, the Democratic Republicans were reading the treaty clause out of the Constitution. The actual dispute was not whether the House could participate in treaty making. The treaty was already made. The question was, did the House have to appropriate funds to implement the treaty, A, uh, and, and, and B, did the, could a treaty be made on objects committed to Congress's care by Article One, Section 8, say, Commerce Authority, for instance? And the House just had a different opinion on that, or many members of the House had a different opinion on that. They thought that they were not obligated by the Constitution to implement a treaty, even if the treaty was, quote, the supreme law of the land. And they thought that a treaty could not make federal law with respect to commerce or taxes, that only Congress could regulate such matters. And uh, that first reading of the Constitution has been sort of tossed aside by history. That is to say, no one thinks that the Congress has to implement a treaty anymore, or I'd say very few people think that, that it, they think it's now permissible for Congress to thwart a treaty, not implement it, even though it's been made by the President with the consent of the Senate. And on the second point, people still believe this as to, with respect to certain things. That is to say, people still say that Treaties can't appropriate, treaties can't raise taxes, treaties can't make crimes. There are certain areas of, of foreign relations law, or more specific, certain areas of congressional authority where people continue to believe that the House has a monopoly on, on certain actions. So the treaties can make international agreements as to what the United States will do, but they can't actually legislate in these areas. Uh, and that's that's a provision that continues to this day. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Yes, the time has come. Yes, everybody's time comes. So I want to say this is just a you know it's a it's a majestic book. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, I want to you know I want to say is it really the second creation or is it more of a growing pain? Right when a you know a young boy becomes a man is that a second creation or is that a growing pain? And I I think. You know, growing, you know, growing pains would not be a good title. Second creation is so much better. But I, I you know, I, 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 for all it, how, you know, for however great it is, and it is quite great, I, I, I don't think of it as a second creation. Thank you. Well, it won't be. Oh, sorry. It won't be a surprise that uh, I think my thoughts on this are closer to. Uh, Jonathan's than, than they are to size, uh, and I'll, I'll try to be relevantly brief in, in, in my remarks. Basically, I think I want to make three points uh, by way of a commentary on Jonathan's book. So I think the first and most important claim uh, is that Jonathan, thinking as he was trained, uh, I think in part both by his father and also by his education, uh, to think like a historian, understands, in a sense, that constitutional law, as we think about it, was something uh, that Americans had to create. Whether constitutional law in the terms in which we defined it existed before uh, either 1788 or perhaps one could argue 1780 uh, in the American sense uh, seems to me to be an open question. I, I think some of the science remarks uh, go to saying that there, there were indeed lots of suppositions about legal interpretation which were pre-existing and in, in which uh, recurred and were further articulated uh, in the context of, of, of the disputes that, uh, that Johnson, uh, Jonathan walks our way through. I think it's fair to say that, uh, in a sense, constitutional law, as Americans now think of it, to, to, or, or let's say uh, more broadly, authoritative constitutional interpretation, was something that could only evolve once you worked out the American definition of what exactly a constitution was. The constitution was a document that had to be framed under very distinctive purposes and then ratified again under, you know, in, 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 in very distinctive ways. Uh, and if you did those things correctly, the Constitution would then become supreme fundamental law enforceable upon both the national government uh, and the states uh, under the authority of, of the supremacy clause. So that notion of writtenness which, with which Jonathan is preoccupied in the, early, in the opening passages of his book uh, and this process of adoption you know, both uh, how the Constitution was proposed and how it was ratified, 
those are instrumental to his account. And it's, to my way of thinking, mark a truly significant point of departure uh, in, in how Americans thought uh, constitutionally. Uh, there were modes of interpretation out there, but the questions of which ones would apply and how they'd be articulated uh, and how they'd be made authoritative uh, remain to be uh, discovered. Um, and the second point is in working out what this discovery meant, uh, in understanding what the process of authoritative constitutional interpretation entailed, the process with which we're concerned was as much political as legal. Supreme Court does very little serious work in the 1790s. I'm a big fan, as it happens, of the case of U.S. versus Hilton. But you can mention this case to a group of law students, and I think uh, one of my, or a former grand city might face this challenge recently. <laughs> Uh, and kind of drew a blank. And U.S. versus Hilton is, is to me, is an, it's an authoritative example of judicial review uh, of uh, the Constitution. Uh, ordinarily, we think the Marbury versus Madison, 1803, is the authoritative, quote unquote, establishment of the practice of judicial review. Uh, I think it arose earlier, but that's, in a certain sense, Hilton versus U.S. is probably the one truly significant common law case of the 1790s. The authoritative interpretation is taking place uh, within Congress. Uh, as, as side notes, uh, you know, I think quite correctly, the, the, the interweaving, here's interweaving in a somewhat different sense of the term, the interweaving of political and interpretive purposes or political and legal interpretive purposes in this process is, is quite apparent and it's been, I think, really the major theme of really my almost a half century scholar work of my own to figure out where is the boundary between politics and interpretation, why? Uh, so it has, it has a political dimension, but essentially the story that Jonathan wants to tell forces us to think quite seriously about the role of Congress uh, as, as, as a constitutional media. Since the study of constitutional interpretation has always been preoccupied with judges and courts rather than other institutions, uh, that's a, a necessary and extremely helpful corrective to the misconceptions uh, which have prevailed here. Uh, and that's I mean, my second point, therefore, about the essentially political nature of the development of, of modes and norms of interpretation uh, relates to my third point, which has to do with the, the dicey subject of originalism. Um, so there are a handful of historians, Jonathan and I, are, I, don't, I don't know if we're two-thirds of them, but you know, maybe, you know, maybe two-fifths. There, there is a handful of historians um, who take originalism as a serious subject that's worthy of examination. Most historians think it's a kind of lawyer's game. Um, it's you know, you're highly vulnerable to what we usually describe as law office history, which kind of goes, get me a site, and you know, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the rest of the work. Um, I think Jonathan and I happen to agree that um, in the current debates over originalism, there are two main modes of interpretation. One sees the Constitution uh, solely or primarily as a semantic text, which was written, avowedly written, with the idea that its interpretation would depend upon the learned uh, expertise of uh, authoritative interpreters, which would be a story about the origins of judicial review and how it's supposed to operate. Uh, and the rest of us would say that now, in fact, there is a, and this is what's known colloquially as semantic or public meaning originalism and makes a variety of assumptions. Such assumptions, the Constitution is first and foremost a text, a written text, and there are certain linguistic <laughs> modes of interpretation that should dominate uh, issues of adjudication. A handful of us happen to think that the Constitution is also, perhaps even primarily, an essentially political document, uh, and that the circumstances that were informative to the adoption of each clause uh, you know, each, not just each article. Of course, the idea of articles was a very late change in the Constitution. It takes place only with Governor Morris's, uh, you know, in, in, in inspiration. John and I, I think, represent, you know, you know, speak for a point of view. It says, no, to really understand the original meaning of the text, or we wanted to find that, you have to reconstruct the history of how these clauses were adopted. It was not primarily a, a, a linguistic game, though sometimes choices of language matter a lot. It matters a great deal when you know, the Constitutional Convention decides that Congress will have the power not to make war, but to, but to declare war. We have to ask what's the difference between making and declaring and sort out, uh, sort out the consequences. But I think the more fundamental point that, that Jonathan's book illustrates, and I think it's perfectly consistent uh, with my book, which is why Sai is right to you know, put them, if this is in fact what you've done, to put them on the shelf together, 
I'll omit Sy's uh, favorite remark about my approach to the Constitution, at least for now. Um, but um, you know, in, in any case, I think we share that idea that to understand the Constitution, if you don't understand the political context from which either the document as a whole or its particular clauses emerge, you'll never really understand what its meaning was. I mean, that's not to say there aren't other rules of interpretation you can follow if you wish to do so. Uh, that will produce you know, manageable or workable results. Uh, but they won't be authentic in the same way that historians' reconstruction of this would be. So I think a lot of this may simply, a lot of this difference may simply represent uh, the divergent uh, me methodologies uh, to which we're subject. Lawyers, I, I always admire lawyers because they're intellectually eclectic. Um, I think they have to have a lot of facility to you know, become the kinds of practitioners they are. They can move among the disciplines um, you know, with, with gay abandon in a certain sense and you know, you know, pick, pick and choose where they will. I think in some ways they lack the stubbornness of the historian, the idea that you really need to be able to document. You know, there are certain rules or certain norms about how you establish what actually happened in the past. And uh, you know, doing history is messy and it's often inconclusive. It often, it often leads to partial results that won't satisfy a strong originalist demand. If your presupposition is the Constitution had an original meaning, uh, then in a certain sense, you, you are assuming fixity to begin with. Historians are committed to that. It could be that some clauses were, you know, were better worked out than others and, and were perfectly you know, content to spread that. Asking what does it mean to have a direct tax is not a bad way to get at this issue. So I think those are three big points. Just thinking about the idea of um, you know, why, why was the idea of authoritative constitutional interpretation itself something of a novelty? The recognition that the process was inherently political in nature and not simply the work of lawyers and judges. And third, if that's true, that has significant implications for how we think about the originals project. Thank you. So this is a fantastic book, and I would say that the reference to Harry Potter is apt because uh, Jonathan uh, takes us uh, on an imaginative journey in this book um, and asks us to put aside our received ideas about the US Constitution. Um, and in doing so, he asks us really to imagine what kind of thing, what kind of object the Constitution was uh, when it was originally created, which is an object very different in his account than what we imagine it was. Um, so, you know, as we've heard, uh, it wasn't the textual grant of powers and rights uh, that has been received within the later United States uh, under his account, um, as well as across the world. So uh, this is a book that unseats our conception of constitutionalism, not only domestically, but if we think that the U.S. Constitution originated in a different way, it can uh, revise our understanding of why we uh, think that constitutionalism and written constitutionalism is good as, as such. Um, so I, instead, I, he suggests the Constitution, as initially drafted, uh, was the sketch of a system that was conceived dynamically and without meticulous linguistic precision. So the conception of the Constitution changed significantly and permanently, though, in the decade after its creation. And this occurred, as he shows, largely through congressional eng engagement with concrete problems that came up under the Constitution and Congress's efforts to sort out the interpretive problems that these issues raised. So I just want to highlight that the, his discussion of these particular controversies is really quite fascinating in and of themselves, uh, even if you don't uh, go along with the rest of his methodological uh, extrapolation. So I found uh, the discussions of uh, the meaning of constitutional silence in relation to the removal power really fascinating because often we think about ambiguity in the Constitution as opposed to silence, and he talks about how silence plays out within the removal discussion. Um, also, he really uh, interestingly highlights how the discussion about whether to have the Bill of Rights as a whole set of appended amendments or integrated into the Constitution changes the nature of what the Constitution is as well. So both of those contexts really uh, are very interesting discussions in and of themselves, uh, even apart from the larger claim about what the Constitution was when it was ratified. <clears throat> so early in the book, uh, he notes that some thought of linguistic features as crucial in declaring rights um, and, and says that um, anti-federalists became preoccupied with language's capacity to regulate power and fell back on linguistic precision as the only mechanism that might wall off the dangers invited by vesting the Constitution with the kind of vast discretion 
that the Federalist Project necessarily require. So we might think, based on this, why wasn't the Bill of Rights itself more linguistically precise since the Anti-Federalists really wanted the Bill of Rights? And he returns to precisely this point, uh, saying in discussing the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, uh, that Madison actually had deliberately tried to weaken uh, the textual additions further through uh, the, the, the vagueness of the language of these. So even though the anti-federalists wanted uh, linguistic precision, the Bill of Rights, in a sense, uh, was designed in part to undermine that kind of certain meaning. So I think that was a, a really fascinating point that he brings up. And I, those of you who were at the discussion of Mary Builder's book, Madison's Hand, I uh, will also appreciate uh, his treatment of Madison, um, whose fluctuations over time also play a crucial role in Jonathan's story, um, as the transformations in Madison's approach to the Constitution largely track the change over the course of the book in how the Constitution is understood. Um, so as uh, Jonathan indicates almost halfway through his story, quote, the Constitution needed fixing, but in addressing that need, it might also be fixed perpetually. So the ambiguity of fixation itself. Um, the Virginian who had otherwise celebrated the creative constitutional moment was now hinting that it might be limited not substantively, but chronologically. The Constitution was to be fleshed out, but Madison was now wondering how long would this period, period last? And I think as Jonathan shows us, uh, it was only lasting, it only lasted a decade. So, what it took to render the Constitution a fixed object uh, occurred in three stages as he uh, outlines towards the end of the book. The first stage involved conceiving of the Constitution as a linguistic artifact, so thinking of the Constitution itself in linguistic terms. And the second uh, involved tethering the Constitution's words to the archive of its creation. Finally, the document was linked to, quote, the concept of contingent, willful constitutional authorship. So three elements to fixation. And the, for the rest of my brief remarks, I just want to connect these aspects with uh, certain contemporary interpretive debates about the Constitution, which they're very intimately linked with. And I think that Jonathan leaves those to implication in the book largely, and I would love to hear a little bit more commentary from him about them. So, uh, first of all, um, the interest in fixing and fixation ties into a lot of recent debates about the liquidation of constitutional meaning. Um, so, Will Bode recently published a piece in the Stanford Law Review on constitutional liquidation, and those endorsing an idea of liquidation, uh, which itself comes out of Madison, uh, think of post-constitution practice as settling the meaning of terms that were underdetermined or ambiguous at the time of ratification. So I think this story in the second creation of the period following the ratification of the Constitution could itself be seen as a larger kind of liquidation narrative, dealing not with a particular clause or provision, but instead with the Constitution as a whole. So if we see this period, this decade after ratification, as being about the liquidation of the Constitution, we could say, well, the Constitution itself, when ratified, was an underdetermined kind of object, which had to be cashed out through the debates in Congress that he so eloquently catalogs. And liquidated in that way, it turned out to be a document whose importance lay in its writtenness rather than in the aspects that those at the Constitutional Convention had initially <coughs> emphasized. So under this vision, the contingency that he uh, emphasizes of how the Constitution became what it was would matter less than the fact that it turned out to be fixed shortly after the founding and has been fixed ever since. So I think that if it, this redescription might allow the book to be reincorporated into a defense of originalism rather than serving as a critique of it. So I'm, I'm curious about whether that's possible. Secondly, I think another area that pertains to contemporary debates in constitutional interpretation has to do with the relationship between constitutional authorship and readership, or even what counts as authorship. And remember, the third aspect of fixation had to do with this concept of contingent, willful constitutional authorship. So who are these authors is one question. And uh, Jonathan looks to, um, you know, he, he observes the turn to assertions of willful constitutional authorship, 
but he also delves into debates about whether the Constitution should be read as ordinary people would or according to lawyers, expert mediation. And he also looks at the varying uses to which participants in the debates over the Jay Treaty put the Constitutional Convention and the ratification debates. For contemporary constitutional theorists, the question of whether the Constitution should be read through the lens of its authors or of its original readers thought of as the ratifiers is connected with what legitimates the Constitution in the first instance. The argument, for instance, of some original meaning originalists is that the Constitution should be understood according to what its language would have conveyed at the time, because it is that sense that the people would have ratified rather than any surreptitious meaning inserted by the Constitution's drafters. A difficulty arises with terms like habeas corpus or other words of legal significance, which some might argue held only a vague uh, meaning for non-lawyers. Yet texts like Justice of the Peace Manuals and other works aim to translate legal doctrine to a lay audience and these cash out these terms for the ordinary reader, so the dichotomy between legal and non-legal understandings might not have been as strict as it might seem. But I would say that because of the centrality of legitimacy and the question of what legitimates constitutional interpretation to debates about interpretation today, I would be curious to hear Jonathan elaborate in more detail on how and whether legitimacy plays into the story that he tells in The Second Creation. So, I think that it's to our benefit that the second creation has left open some of these questions about the connection between the history that it's telling and its potential normative implications for constitutional theory. The richness of the story that it tells and its turns and surprises will continue to furnish many of us with ample material for engagement and deliberation in the years to come. Thanks for that. Take a few minutes to respond. Okay, I'll try to keep it uh, brief. <laughs> First, <laughs> thanks to to my 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 three panelists. That was that's just an extraordinary sort of treasure trove of reactions to think about and um, to work through. Um, the Harry Potter of constitutional books. I think <laughs> we definitely need to get that on <laughs> the back of the paperback. <laughs> Pull, pull your strings, do your magic, and make sure that happens. Um, so you, you were brought in in part as the dissenter, I imagine, and you have played this role, <laughs> this role well. Um, I appreciate all, all the praise and admiration and, and everything you said about um, what you admired. And I thought everything you, you raised, Sai, that was more critical in nature was, was, was fair and is, is worthy of, of substantive um, Conversation. So I'll just pick out a couple um, because working through, by my count, there were ten things. Um, <laughs> we'll, uh, but we'll also have time at dinner and beyond. Um, so I think the first point about fixity is really important um, because this is something I try to argue in the book, and I say try to because it's a complex concept that um, I know can be can be difficult to grasp. As I see it. Um, Americans, the story usually goes, Americans came of age under the British Constitution, which was unwritten and customary. It had certain written elements, but you couldn't locate it in any particular place. And because it was customary and it sort of worked in tandem with the common law, it wasn't fixed. It changed over time. It was sort of a living constitution, if you will. And the American Constitution, American constitutions and then the federal constitution were so different precisely because they were written and they were written to ensure that they would be fixed in the ways the British Constitution was not. But I think something that's really important to recognize is if you study people talking about the British Constitution, most of all, colonial Americans living under it, they never referred to it as unfixed. To the extent they ever weighed in on the matter, they talked about the British Constitution being fixed, or at least their understanding of what it ought to be, and that all good constitutions were fixed. So throughout the imperial crisis, you find all this evidence from Samuel Adams to James Otis to John Adams to others saying the problem with what Parliament is doing is it's ignoring the fixed constitution. So they didn't have any trouble reconciling the idea of constitutional fixity with an unwritten customary constitution. So I think really what happens in the American setting is not inventing the idea of constitutional fixity, but remaking an existing concept. And remaking it in such a way that a combination that would have made perfect sense to people in the 18th century English-speaking world, that constitutions were fixed and changing at the same time, 
is now a total paradox for us, I would argue, precisely because of the byproduct of the debates of the 1790s that ripped these two apart and made fixity something that was incompatible with change. And that, I think, is the real legacy of what happens in this post-ratification period, that what had previously seemed intelligible, constitutions, novel constitutional controversies arise. You create new constitutional meaning, constitutional meaning that better exposed the deep underlying ancient principles that had always been there, that it was sort of this recursive quality. It was now either the Constitution is changing or it's fixed, one or the other. And I think that's what John Marshall and Marbury B. Madison and others post-ratification um, when, they, when they are talking about the, con the American constitutions being fixed, unlike British constitutions and fixed because they're written, I think what they're talking about is a new kind of fixity that wasn't quite in play, I would say, um, in 1788. So was the Constitution, the federal constitution, born fixed? I would say yes, but my understanding is, my argument would be, it was born fixed in a way that we would not fully recognize, a different conception of fixity. So then I think that, that spills out into some of the other um, things that you raised, which I think uh, basically came um, down to um, seeing these debates in Congress about not fundamental disagreements over what the Constitution is, but sort of second order disagreements, very fundamental in their own way, but about um, more specific aspects of what the Constitution means. As you said, the removal debate, it's not, everything's not on the table. It's, it's sort of more circumscribed, same thing with the bank, but I would suggest nonetheless, even if that's true, what is on the table, um, in part because fixity itself is undergoing this transformation, is fairly dramatic. And I would point to the removal debate. Um, you have initially the people who want presidential removal, like James Madison, Fisher Ames, John Lawrence, Theodore Sedgwick, ultimately vote differently on the final bill because Madison has come to believe that the vesting power, the vesting clause of Article Two. Contrary to what he had thought in May of 1789, June of 1789, he's changed his mind. He says, actually, we Congress don't have to give the right of removal. It's actually there in the Constitution. And then his allies, Theodore Sedgwick, um, John Lawrence, and others say, no, I can't go along with that. The whole point of this was the Constitution is silent. We have to give it meaning it didn't have. So if we're not going to write a bill that gives the president the power to remove, he won't have it. Um, and you, you, this sort of confused conclusion that I think speaks to um, the ways in which people, um, these debates are, are more than just over um, specific competing positions on removal. And then just lastly, I would say um, regarding rules of interpretation, um, I, I take your point to be that there are sort of more default rules available that if not obviously applicable are applicable in a more straightforward or usable sense than perhaps um, I give credit for. Um, I think what I'm trying to do in the book is point to the problem with any existing set of rules that could be located is it then begs the question, all those rules are tethered to seeing the Constitution a certain way, and you can just reject that, that that's even um, an applicable category. So one example being Lane Blackstone, some people say, oh, Blackstone's rules are perfectly applicable, but only for statutes, not for constitutions. Or then other people like William Findlay say, in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, we fought this revolution for some reason, <laughs> We're not going to use British legal reasoning to interpret our Constitution. It has no application whatsoever. And James Wilson finds this <laughs> baffling and bizarre. I mean, the historians love the arguments that are weird. The lawyers um, kind of maybe slide those over as, as, as the bad arguments, like what it lies with. <laughs> um, but to me, that really, you know, I think William Finley's making a point. He's saying, OK, so Blackstone's rules of interpretation, great, but they have nothing to do with what we're talking about here. But then even if you just look at, I mean, so that's just two potential examples. Some people said the Constitution was like a power of attorney, a fiduciary trust. That carried with it an understanding that the Constitution should be construed narrowly, the powers that it grants. But then lots of other people turned around and said, it's not a fiduciary trust at all. It's a, it's a corporate charter creating a new corporation, the United States of America, a national polity. And charters of incorporation grant power more broadly. And the powers that can be exercised are based on the purposes of setting up the charter. So someone like. Um, uh, Fisher Ames or John Vining in the bank debate say, I don't really care what the necessary and proper clause says. I care what the preamble says, which lays out the purposes of the government, the purposes of the corporation. It says we can legislate for the general welfare, ergo. Um, doesn't really matter what it says Congress can or cannot legislate in the name of. Um, we have this broader power. Um, and Madison responds and says, well, you've completely misunderstood not just how to interpret the Constitution, but what it actually is. 
Um, so I would say the default rules of interpretation are probably the best way, I would think, of getting in on all the live options that are on the table. Now, um, there still could be questions about whether it caches out to um, something like the second creation rather than something like growing pains, maybe something in between. <laughs> I'm not sure what that would be. Um, but I think those are all fair considerations, um, and I, I very much get where they're all coming from. I'd love to talk about the, the others, um, but I want to include more of the audience. So I think I'll just quickly move on to um, to, to Jack's points, um, which uh, I, I certainly largely um, agreed with, and certainly his appreciation building off of what I just said about what was novel about this exercise, that at the end of the day, trying to ground what it was to legitimately draw content from the Constitution meant having to say something about what the Constitution was, and it was always possible to point to how it was novel and unprecedented. Maybe some analogies worked, but they never worked perfectly. It was always square peg in round hole. As for originalism, I mean, Jack certainly knows that you know, as historians, we, we don't just, I mean, context is a word that can be thrown around. I think many originalists take context very seriously, but it's usually what kind of context towards what end. Usually originalists are interested in finding out what a particular provision in the Constitution meant. Historians are usually interested in trying to figure out what different people at the time thought was a good or bad or possible argument, and particularly drawing attention to all the arguments that seem to be getting traction that wouldn't seem to get traction um, today. And I think the Jay Treaty debate is a good example of this, uh, because I think I know a lot of modern lawyers see what the House Republicans argued. I mean, I, you gave them a very fair reading, but I know other lawyers who have said, what an absurd set of arguments that James Madison and William Findlay and certainly you know, Edward Livingston and those who were sort of more extravagant in what they were saying about what the treaty power um, entailed. But it's precisely for that reason that I think it says something meaningful um, that House Republicans got so far pushing um, this argument. Um, and so I, I think this sort of distinction between semantic and political does really get at the heart of it. But, but I think we need to then do more work about is that then a disagreement about what we're looking for, or strictly speaking, a disagreement in method. I think more conversation could be had on that uh, front. And then to uh, Bernie's terrific um, comments, there was uh, much to unpack there. Liquidation um, becoming a hot topic, thanks <laughs> not especially to Will Bode, um, you know, my good friend who wrote this really exhilarating new piece trying to take liquidation, something that Madison first really sketches out in Federalist 37 when he says, no matter what you do with um, constitutional language, there's always going to be a lot of, a fair amount of indeterminacy until concrete episodes allow you to adjudicate or liquidate um, the meaning of certain provisions, that you sort of need this post, you need this usage um, practice to figure out what it means. Will has tried to derive from this and other things um, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and others say to show how liquidation is actually an extension of originalism. Uh, since its early days, I think certain questions um, can be raised. What, what does it mean if something is liquidated? Um, Sai's wonderful colleague, Caleb Nelson, who was the first to really talk about this, said that when it was liquidated, it was then fixed. Will says it's not necessarily fixed. It can be reliquidated as long as it follows this sort of three-step approach that I would actually argue is more Bodian than Madisonian. Um, <laughs> and, and Will should just own it as his own. Uh, but that's for another time. He's not, he's not here. So I think that raises a question, right? So what does it mean that something has been liquidated? What does it mean that the power president now has the power of removal? Is it liquidated because sort of everybody at the time agrees? Do you need a certain period of time? If a new generation comes along and thinks a new controversy um, has, has, has brought fresh ambiguity and uncertainty, can it then be reliquidated and reopened? There's a point at which liquidation um, breaks down any meaningful distinction, arguably, between originalism and living constitutionalism. But also, second, all liquidation thus far has been focused on specific aspects of the Constitution. What does this part of the Constitution mean, or what is that part? And your point, Bernie, was about the whole Constitution. And I think that raises a set of questions that I'm not sure Will and other originalists have yet considered um, that would require dissenting from size dissent and saying that <laughs> there is something in terms of what the Constitution is to be liquidated. There's not just something captured in the notion of writtenness or fixity or the oath that already creates a more or less bounded space. Um, 
And if that's also liquidation, I, I just think that's categorically different. It doesn't mean the project doesn't work, but that would be very different than what we, I think, that's certainly what Madison was describing and Will and others seem to be using, which was about specific provisions in the Constitution that can then be cashed out rather than kind of the whole Constitution as an object. And then just lastly on your question of sort of authority and authorship and readership, most of modern originalism, as you said, many of my great students from my originalism class are, who are in the audience are experts on this, know that sort of the fundamental trans transition in modern originalist thinking from trying to recover original intent or what the authors were trying to put in the Constitution to original public meaning or forget what the authors did, just what did the Constitution, what would it have meant to an average reader? In some ways, those distinctions map onto the 1790s and the early republic, but I think often not all that elegantly. Um, one, I, I'm always struck by, even though Madison in 1796 and the Jay Treaty makes a big deal of saying that who cares what the Constitutional Convention said, it's all about the ratifying conventions. As he's completing his Constitutional Convention notes, he often appeals to them a lot and talks about how the convention itself can be a source of understanding the history of the Constitution, not just its public meaning or ratification. And then two, I think there's a big difference between public meaning, just what do the words of the Constitution mean, and something else that they usually were after more, with specific opinions that people made in the ratifying debates. So it's not what does the treaty power mean if we look at these words and imagine an average informed reader. It's but what did James Wilson actually say in Pennsylvania? And that's something about his contingent authorship. He was a creator, and he was in that space vested with that authority. His specific opinion, um, it, make, it keeps subjectivity at the heart of it, I think, more than we sometimes recognize. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. So um, I gather uh, my task here is to offer a very quick question and then open it up to you. Uh, and you can just ignore the question and take it on to, uh, to the audience is fine with me. Um, but one question that uh, kind of comes up for me listening to, um, to all of you is really the question of context and uh, how we think about context in this debate. So um, uh, I may be misinterpreting you, Jack, but I, I hear Jack to be saying to some extent this debate we're having about context is really just a question of methodology. Are we a historian or a lawyer looking at this period? The historian's toolkit is to contextualize everything deeply. Uh, and so, of course, we look at um, every little bit of the Constitution in its immediate political context. Um, the other way of, 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 and maybe these are not mutually exclusive, right, thinking about context is really has to do with this notion of what we mean by fixity. So you said we, we don't think of fixity and we, we think of fixity and change as uh, incompatible. But in fact, much of this conversation has been that um, actually we, we are all in agreement now somehow that fixity and change are compatible. Uh, and it's a, so, so Sai says, uh, I forget your exact phrase, the, um, the, uh, the clause is fixed, but its meaning changes over time depending on circumstance, depending on context, uh, or will bode's uh, liquidation. So, you know, is, is <laughs> It, you know, this goes to Bernie's ultimate question, right? Is your book a book of pure history, a la, a la Jack here, as a kind of conception of the divide? Or, or is, is this an intervention in the kind of proper mode of constitutional interpretation that will somehow uh, give us the place for, for context? Uh, um, yeah. Can it be both? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Because yeah. um, I certainly, it's not a book about constitutional interpretation or it's modern debates or originalism, but I very much hope it's a book that has clear implications for that and people invested in those debates will read it with interest and, and use it as, as sort of the ways I think Sai and Bernie were talking about. Um, but I think we, we can maybe make a distinction between argument and practice. And at the heart of my book, since I'm an intellectual historian, is I think there is real power to the kinds of arguments that communities make and the ways that those get sort of normalized or essentialized over time and how that can sort of shape one's mental horizons and um, foreshorten certain ways of looking at things. So I mean, a, a good example from recent work by um, Judd Campbell, my good friend who has just published an article in the Texas Law Review called The Invention of First Amendment Federalism. Um, I think I draw on this because I think it's a specific example that I think helps address your point, Amalia. So, he argues that in the late 1790s during the Sedition Act crisis, after my book is over, Republicans realizing um, that federal juries that are now going to be stacked by Federalist 
appointed federal marshals are no longer going to safeguard press freedoms. Um, so what they had thought had been the primary way to protect press freedoms under the First Amendment is now gone. And they effectively acknowledge that they're making a new argument. They now trot out this new argument that actually the First Amendment doesn't a, puts a categorical distinction on anything Congress can do to block the press. And they're acknowledging this is not what we thought or anyone thought in 1788, but it's now, um, it's now the right way to understand the First Amendment. But even though they're kind of hinting at that, the clear novelty, the fact that you can trace how their argument has changed, they present the entire argument from the beginning of end to the crisis as merely recovering and authorizing what had been obvious in the ratification debates of 1788. And I think what this shows is they're creating a new constitutional meaning that is changing and has changed how we think about the First Amendment. But the way they justified it and the way they fit it into their constitutional consciousness required, speaking this language of fixed constitutionalism, that no longer had a place for change working with fixity it was. We don't think this about the First Amendment. 1798 hasn't created this about the First Amendment. It was always there, and Federalists are just misreading it. I think that's really what you get. You still get change and fixity, but you get this new way of talking about it that I think endures to this day, I would argue. Oh, yes, so, so please, uh, there are two microphones here. You need to take oh, it yeah. off. <laughs> no, I gotta use the mic. Take it out of the stand. No. Should be. Where's Storzy when we need him? Oh, here we go. Go ahead. Thanks so much for this interesting panel. And I haven't read the book, and I'm now going to. I'm fascinated. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> And my question relates to the issue of perhaps context and fixity and legitimacy. The way I have heard the description of the book is that the Constitution happened in a vacuum and that the people who made the Constitution didn't know what they were creating and that it took a decade to work this out. But it seems to me that there was incredible precedent there's precedent, first negative precedent, in the Articles of Confederation. They knew what they didn't want. And then all of the states, I think maybe except Rhode Island, had by this time written constitutions. And that they drew from the, the precedent of some of these constitutions. And that from the very beginning in the colonies, in fact, there were written charters. So it wasn't all unwritten, as in the British unwritten constitution. There were charters for the original colonies, which told them how to behave, how to, to, to establish law for the colonies. So I'm asking, and perhaps it's in the book and I just haven't read it yet, and uh, if, if you've taken into consideration the fact that there is precedent for a written constitution, and they weren't there working in a vacuum with uh, creating something that they didn't know what it would look like or how it would work. Well, they did. Thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so short answer, yes, you're absolutely right. There does not create it in a vacuum and everything you talked about, I tried to talk about um, to some extent in the book. But even if there are these precedents, it still raises these questions. So for instance, um, 1776 comes, royal authority in the colonies collapses, the separate States, previously colonies, now states, have to draw up new charters of government. Rhode Island and Connecticut say, well, we already have these charters. We don't need a new constitution. We'll just keep this charter, delete the language that pledged loyalty to the king, and pledge loyalty to the state of Rhode Island or Connecticut. And that will be our constitution. But then the question is, is that part of the Constitution, or maybe entry point to the Constitution, or is it itself as a written artifact exclusively the Constitution? And lots of people living under these state constitutions just assumed, as an obvious second nature matter, that there was a category of fundamental law that whether it's in the charter, whether it's in the state constitution or not, is part of the fundamental constitutional law of the realm. So we find all these cases in, in 
state judges issue in the 1770s and 1780s where they say, oh, perhaps this isn't written in the Constitution, but this violates fundamental law, so this, this statute or this provision is obviously illegal. You find some of that spilling over into the 1790s. You find interesting conversations like what happens in August of 1787 when they're debating whether to include a prohibition in the federal Constitution uh, prohibiting ex post facto laws. Oliver Ellsworth and James Wilson, arguably, I mean, you could argue two, the two most sort of prodigious legal minds at the Constitutional Convention, say, we can't have this prohibition because, of course, by just fundamental law, ex post facto laws are illegal, regardless of whether they're in the Constitution. And if people read this, they might think, these people know so little about fundamental law that they thought they had to include it. <laughs> But there's ambiguity because some people respond and say, no, but there's more safety in including it. It's an effective precaution. Um, when they get to bills of attainder, they include it very quickly. And one argument could be they've had less experience um, dealing with prohibitions on bills of attainder as opposed to ex post facto. So you need the written provision more. But they're talking in this term where there's the written constitution and there's the constitution of sort of fundamental law. And they're not necessarily drawing invidious distinctions between the two. I think part of the story I try to tell in, in the 1790s is how those invidious distinctions are increasingly um, created. Another one's the law of nations. Is the law of nations automatically incorporated into the Constitution as sort of general law? So I mentioned there's nothing in, in, in the Constitution that allows, um, that allows sort of courts to punish people for violating the law of nations minus a federal statute making it a crime. But they do that um, in the case of Henfield's case. And it's complicated questions about whether that means the law of nations is in the Constitution. But there's another issue, right? Do you have to write the law of nations into the written Constitution for it to be part of fundamental law or not? They're debating that. They don't think it's just straightforward. Um, and I think that's part of, so even though there's no precedent, or even though there's plenty of precedent, those precedents don't necessarily clarify um, the full meaning of the Constitution being written, if, if that answers your question. I have an answer either, uh, a detail and a general. Detail is, I'm intrigued by treaties. Where do they sit in the legal hierarchy? The general, and you can go to where they set up the end of your book, not necessarily today. The general is, it seems to me that there are two things from the writing of the Constitution to 10 years later. One, they can be narrowing and fixing the Constitution, filling in the loopholes. Or they can be liquidating it based on politics. I want a uh, national bank. So I'll interpret it this way. Nothing to do with narrowing and channel. One today I call it originalism, which says that period fixed it. Another is active liberty, living constitution, which says, OK, this administration wants to go this way, interpret it this way. Previous administration wanted to go this way, interprets it this way, and the Constitution is just propaganda. <laughs> what happened after 10 years? Where do you think, if this is an appropriate definition, where do you think they were going? Fixing or liquidating? So I, I would say both, but <laughs> framed, framed with that distinction now very much on the table. That Either, either it's fixed or it's maybe not propaganda, but open for each generation to sort of change it as they will. So it's certainly not coming out of the 1790s. People don't, I mean, it's not as though everybody just sees it as fixed. What I think has changed is that the way of talking about fixity that structures the debate to articulate what you just articulated is, what's, is what has happened. People continue to, to debate out of the 1790s into the 19th century up to 2019. Um, but the form in which they're debating and the way in which they're making those arguments and conceiving what the fault lines are, I think, is what has changed. So there are people who are liquidating. There are people who are, who are, who are talking about it being fixed and resting a lot on that. But I don't think it's actually what they're doing, and it's more how they're conceiving of the matter um, that is really, really the central issue. 
at least what I'm trying to argue. Uh, so first, a commercial announcement. Uh, the bookstore has a display uh, of Jonathan's book. So those of you who do want to get it and read it, uh, I, I, easy to find. Uh, I, have, I do have a question, have lots of questions, but the one I'm going to throw to you is this. Several mentions that uh, y your theory is uh, that this period ends at the end of roughly 10 years. And I wonder why is that so? Because so the, first, the 1790s are a period of federalist dominance, and they have certain constitutional ideas that get embedded. And then they're replaced by the Jeffersonians for the next uh, 20 years or more. Uh, and the Jeffersonians also have constitutional theories. Uh, and many of them get embedded. In and it isn't as if all these questions are resolved in the first 10 years. So uh, you know, can the country acquire new territories? Uh, are there, is there a federal a, a common law? Uh, what exactly is the new role of the federal judiciary after the, in the wake of the Judiciary Act of uh, re repeal and, uh, and so forth? We could go down the list and you could have four more big chapters. Uh, and so did you just end because the book was already long enough? Or, <laughs> you know, it, it, or, or is it going to be like Harry Potter? <laughs> There are going to be seven of these books, and uh, the, the third creation and the fourth creation. Or the growing pains of the second creation. The third. <laughs> yeah. Excellent question, because I think this gets at the heart of, of, of what the book is trying to say and what it's not trying to say. So the idea that there are fundamental constitutional disputes of this nature begins the minute the Constitution goes live and is still happening today. There are periods where of, of, of more or less fermentation, cert certainly. But that activity and that kind of engagement is not what stops in 1796. I wouldn't say anything stops. What I'm trying to argue is that a particular way of imagining the Constitution that I don't think would have been entirely intuitive when the Constitution was written and ratified has come into focus and has received a considerable amount of support in 1796. That's what the Jay Treaty really produces. I think as I laid out well what I was trying to say. Now moving forward, there'll be those people who dissent from that way of thinking about it or, ex or, or accept it. It's, it's not creating positions or conclusions. I think it's what it has created is a new framework, a new field of argument. Um, that is not the only field of argument, and there's other things that happen to it, but it, it's a fundamental change in the field of argument that is clarified at this moment, and a, a fundamental framing that I would argue has never gone away, that continues to directly inform how we talk about what the Constitution is, and this idea that in some fundamental sex, sense, either you think it's fixed or it's changing, or you desperately try to reconcile the two, but these are antagonists that frame how we think about it. And I think that's what's created. A way of thinking is created that then moving forward continues to be a um, source of fermentation. Okay, so I see a number of people and limited time. So can I suggest maybe we collect some questions? Uh, so first you and, and then Greg. So you're collecting. We're going to collect them and then let him, oh, yeah. <laughs> I found it interesting that the Constitution speaks with a different voice than a time of war. Since it's Earth Day, I thought I'd ask. Looking ahead the next 100 years, if we do, in fact, have climate change, dramatic climate change, and there's some who posit that those who deny it are going <coughs> to admit it because they realize government will need to be the changing force that affects our response to it, will our Constitution live up to that threat and treat it as war? Or Let's what, what can we expect? Sorry. Let's hold on to that and go ahead. I'm going to ask the classic unfair historian question about the book you didn't write. Um, so I was curious, sort of thinking about how your work sits in two strands of both legal and, and sort of rhetorical thought. One, sort of the popular constitutionalism, and then the other, sort of new political histories. Thinking about sort of how your work relates to the people out of doors. And, and not the question about sort of, particularly I'm curious, not why you didn't write about the people. Doors, but more what it means to write about an institution that claims to be representative. 
and how the Congress people themselves imagine their relationship with the people outdoors, particularly at moments like the Jay Treaty, where there is, in fact, a very vigorous debate that's happening out in the streets alongside uh, what's happening in Congress, and how that sort of shapes this debate about the fixing. Yeah, excellent. Um, popular constitutionalism could not be more important, and we need more on it. We have virtually nothing. I mean, there's so little on what ordinary people outside formal positions of power thought about the Constitution between 1787 and 1861. We have Michael Kamen's great book, but that's really mostly post-Civil War. It's a wonderful book. Um, so dissertations to be written. I hope more students take this up. I focus on Congress because I, I had to carve out a specific area that allowed me to recreate the debates in detail. But I'm glad you mentioned the Jay Treaty debate, because that brings the two together in a powerful way. You can't understand the constitutional positions that Republicans are making in the House of Representatives, but for an understanding of popular constitutionalism and what it means that there are daily protests in the street, John Jay being burned in effigy from uh, the southern border of the United States out right up to the northern border, as he, as he reports. Um, that, that intense anger is, is certainly what informs what they're saying, but I think more importantly, is part of their direct justification for what they're doing. Among the many arguments they make for why they have authority to weigh in on the matter of the treaty is they are the people's representatives. And the president and the Senate aren't. And it's a pretty tendentious point given other things that have happened in American political thinking to this point and other arguments people in that chamber had previously made, but it's an argument they make time and time again. That they're all representing the people, but they're somehow representing them in this special way. They can speak for them. They can represent them in that more sort of literal 17th century British way of people aren't here and we can be their image. Um, and that gives a special authority that works in concert with the Constitution. So you know, they tell some Federalists, stop telling me what's in Article 2. Let's talk about what the people want and what it would mean to interpret the Constitution over the complete descent of the entire nation. I mean, they speak in grandiose terms. Um, but that's one way to think about it. So um, I think it's extraordinarily important. And I hope more people, maybe people in this room, do more on popular constitutionalism. We need a lot more of it. As for climate change and whether that will be a, a source for a, a sort of federal grant of implied emergency or war power, um, maybe you have thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not. I mean, I think your sort of broader question is: Will the it's, will the Constitution continue to sort of live on in a certain way? Yeah, and that's you can never quite know that. I mean, does the Constitution fail the Civil War? Is the Civil War a moment when the Constitution is shown to be a kind of great success? Um, there are different ways to think of this. Um, I, I think it, it puts a lot on on the current generation, right? I mean, the, the, if, if there's anything the framers understood, I mean, whatever they thought about writtenness or what, or fixity or any of these things, um, they certainly had an understanding that a constitution could never be that much better than the people who assume positions of power under it. I mean, I just think they thought there were certain questions. You can do your best to create rules that keep people in line, but you have to presuppose a certain kind of political culture that will inform the force people to think about the common good in some kind of a way, that if you've lost that, it doesn't really matter what kind of rules you've set up. That, that, I mean, they, they, I think they were very good students of that, and they often don't get sufficient credit for that. Um, when people ask questions, what, what did they think about this or that? It's like, in some ways, they, didn't, they thought if you're already asking that question, you've kind of missed the, the supporting norms and culture that were necessary. OK, so on that note, please join me in thanking our panelists.